when I started film criticism, one of the things, one of the seminal things that Badi Bharadwaj Rangan uh, had told me, which I will never forget, is to love cinema, to love talking about cinema, and to love writing about cinema are three very distinct, very separate, but perhaps related ways of engaging with films. Now, all of y'all write about cinema. Cinema is a visual medium. Writing is textual. You're using one medium to think about another. In your writings, is there a tension, or do you feel the tension that through words, you're either reducing the images or you're expanding on the images? Is that a tension you feel when you're writing? Mm. Ashish, do you want to go first? Me first, OK. Um, hi, Munni. Hi, Rashmi. <laughs> <laughs> meeting after a long time. Yeah. Uh, Muni, of course, we met more earlier. Um, you know, it'd be really interesting to talk amongst an old group, really, of, 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 of friends uh, about a lot of questions. I, I, it's, uh, here, speaking for myself, I think these are questions to which each of us is going to produce a very individual answer. Um, you know, the thing is that when I began writing about film, this was approximately the, the late 70s. And this was the height of the new Indian cinema, right? Uh, that was when Money Call was in his pomp and, you know, um, uh, all kinds of films were being made. And from roughly the early mid-70s through to the mid-80s, the only people I was actually in conversation with were filmmakers. Mm. They were the people with whom I was basically in dialogue. I did not have, at that time, a cohort of people writing about cinema as my peers. They were filmmakers who were my peers. They were my seniors, or they were actually of my generation. They were the people with whom I developed the closest conversation. I was probably the first of a generation who, I think, had every interest in every aspect of cinema with no desire to make films. I never saw myself as a filmmaker. I was never going to make, a film, make films. But I wanted to know as much about cinema as they did. Right. Now, there's a difference then. You know, the point is that when you write about a film, the film you write about is superior. And your effort as an author is to try and find words to match to that film experience, which is a challenge I never took on. Okay. Because I wanted to say something about the film, and I thought that if people wanted to read me, then they had to listen to what I had to say. And the film was available to me to make my argument, mm. essentially. So I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a small distinction here, because you know, when you try and reflect a work of art as accurately as possible, keeping your writing secondary to it, you know, then, you, then, then you have a different responsibility entirely. Here, the film itself was very often equal to or sometimes even secondary to my argument, mm. which is what I thought was primary. Um, when I became more a historian of cinema, and you know, I started writing about uh, the history of cinema, another problem arose, which I just want to speak one minute about, which is that the history of Indian cinema uh, spans roughly the beginning, the entire 20th century, yeah. and India has the smallest number of survivals of the actual films made. If you go to the National Film Archive of India, it's about 4%, which effectively meant that I was writing in the encyclopedia of thousands of really important films that, never, that did not exist anymore. Right. So I had to rely on secondary sources to rely on extremely important figures of cinema's history, you know, who were probably now unknown. You know, so you had to more or less reconstruct a history out of entirely kind of secondary sort of sources. So that was a, a peculiarly other challenge of writing about a film mm. when the film itself didn't exist right. any longer. At least you assumed it didn't exist any longer. That makes sense. Nasreen? Uh, well, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I, in many ways, uh, I, I did kind of the opposite of what Ashish talked about. I started my work at the late 70s and I started by curating the films, which meant I watched a lot of films, the films that were available. And then after that, I started uh, working around documentary filmmaking. And I thought the best way was to, in fact, document those filmmakers who were still alive so that we would have first-hand experience. I always thought that the horse's mouth told a story that I felt more accurate because he or she was there at the time. 
So basically, what Ashish was talking about was that he concentrated in his begin early writings very much more so on the art cinema or the author cinema, where I concentrated on the popular cinema. So I used to do interviews with Manmohan Desai, Prakash Mehra, all Noshad Saab, all the people who associated with popular cinema. And at that time, I don't know if Ashish agrees or not, we're talking about the 80s. It, uh, popular cinema was really looked down upon as a subject of, of study. It only became kosher a little later, into the late 80s and 90s, did the academics start really looking at it seriously. I have to give total credit for my work to a man called Mr. P.K. Nair, who was the director, founding director of the National Film Archives in Pune. What he taught me was that don't be judgmental. Do not decide what is a classic. You cannot decide that. And I realized later, it is only time that curates classics, not individuals. And also, he taught me about rigor of research. And I would say to everyone, it's research. And what you do, you watch the movies. And I was very, very fortunate when I started uh, filming my interviews, there were a lot of people, like, for example, around Gurudath, who were still alive. So when I was interviewing them from 83 onwards and on film in 87 and 88, they were only, you know, uh, you could say, uh, they were 24 years away from Gurudath's death. So their memory was much closer to the experience of Gurudath than if you interview today someone. There's hardly anyone alive. Yeah. But even if you interview Vahida Ji today, she is how many more years, 60 years from his death? Whereas the people who were closer to that death date, so you have to really think about timeline and histories. And if you go to a second-hand source, they have a great experience. But quite often I found the interviews about Guru Dutt would tell me more, if it was Abrar Alvi speaking, about Abrar Alvi than it would tell me about Guru Dutt. So you actually have a feeling that uh, you you are kind of talking to the person through his or her eyes. The direct experience is what interested me, but of course, Guru, that was no more. So I would uh, try and be uh, clear is that it's always the first-hand experience. And to me, I was never apologetic about popular cinema. I still am. I am not, uh, you know, I don't judge in that way, and my work has been really chronicling and recording filmmakers and film personalities, and not just filmmakers, but also composers and lyricists. Not just that, also making movies more accessible to people. You subtitled over 800 films, and of course we'll get, over, get to that in a bit. Uh, Rashmi? Hello everyone, and uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Actually, I would like to begin with a slight correction in uh, Anupama's introduction of me. Uh, it was Aruna Vasudev who started uh, the first ever quarterly on uh, Asian films, uh, which were hardly known at that time. This was the end of the 80s. So I think all of us are speaking of that one special period. Uh, before uh, the last 20 years of uh, the 20th century, where I think uh, the print uh, form was still the dominant form for uh, discussing uh, cinema, because things changed uh, after the first decade of the 21st century, with all the new technological innovations and the digital turn, etc., etc. So uh, when we started, uh, so Aruna roped me and also Latika Patgaonka. So it was basically the three of us who, who started uh, working on Cinemaya. That was Aruna's dream. And uh, it was only later that we were joined by uh, others. And then this developed into uh, Cinefan, the film festival of Asian films, which later became Oceans. And also Aruna started this network for the promotion of Asian cinema. So when we started editing this journal, we really didn't know uh, if 
uh, it would actually we would actually manage to bring out even four issues. Uh, there was no uh, regular funding. There was nothing. So each issue, uh, Aruna and everyone else just went around getting money for the issues and so on. But to come back to the writing part, this is a, where I really started uh, writing regularly for um, on, film, on films. But the funny part was, and we'd be in splits in that little room in Aruna's house. We didn't have an office or anything. We used to just operate out of her house all through till, till Cinemaya lasted. And um, we'd be in splits because we'd be editing articles by Asian writers on Asian films. And we wouldn't have seen the films. That was a time when there was very little uh, exposure to Asian cinema. We knew much more about Hollywood and um, European films, movements, everything. But very little about our own neighbors, our own continent. And uh, we really wouldn't know how to edit because we hadn't seen the film. And, and we'd wonder if should we say on, at, you know, even prepositions matter. You, you, know, you can't say the cops lay in the coffin, on the coffin. We, we had absolutely no idea because we hadn't seen the film. So it was very hilarious, but we learned. And for me, it was one of the greatest learning experiences because Asia is so, so rich in terms of cinema. There are so many industries all around. And uh, even the smallest of countries have something to show by way of cinema. And it is indeed uh, a bit unfortunate that we know so little about it. But my own writing was about the Soviet cinema. I, I uh, specialized in Russian language and literature and Soviet culture and so on. And this was the time, 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed. And this was the collapse of um, not just a political system, but an entire ideological, economic, and cultural system. Because what the Soviets had uh, created was a, a very, very uh, alternative way of thinking about uh, the role of culture in society and the institutions that should support them and so on. And in fact, India, after independence, with its thinking on mixed economy, which basically meant a mix, uh, uh, mixing it with socialism, mixing a bit of capitalism, socialism, and so on, uh, had taken many of the models from the Soviet system. The very fact of uh, having a film school, you know, Geek in Moscow was the first ever film school uh, in the world set up after the revolution. And uh, so you had an Indian film Tel and Television Institute of India. Then you had uh, the major Indian film festivals, international film festivals. Very few decolonizing countries in the 50s thought so far ahead, 50s and 60s, uh, about culture. And even if they did so about culture, uh, very few countries thought about cinema in particular as India did. So there were many things that had been taken from the Soviet model. And this collapse led to so many independent countries where the former Soviet republics had been, uh, Central Asia, Caucasus, etc. And uh, all the cinemas too then became independent industries and it was a time of transition. And um, I wrote uh, a lot at that time. So uh, I wouldn't say, to come back uh, to your precise question that what do you think that writing in some way reduces the uh, complexity of the image, which is both visual, sound, and so many other things uh, in cinema? I, I would say no, really. Of course, a kind of descriptive writing is possible uh, where you kind of describe the image, but uh, for me, Cinema writing, writing about films has always meant um, looking at the larger socio political, cultural context from which the film emerges, but not looking at it as something separate from the film or separate from the image, but to kind of see how the images within the film manifest that particular context. So, um, 
my work really has been more uh, in that way. That makes sense. Now, when we're writing about, when we're thinking about writing about cinema, there is this delicate balance that exists, which is how much should it be about the art and how much should it be about the artist? Uh, and I know we touched upon this very briefly in, in your answers. For example, uh, Nasreen Rashmi, both of you all wrote about Gurudath, but you know, Nasreen's book was more about cobbling together the stories in the making of his films, but Rashmi, you were more interested in uh, the stylistic innovations that were coming out of his uh, cinema. Ashish, in your book, John Ghatak Tarkovsky, uh, but you're writing about so much, so many of the cinema that was emerging from the protest movements. The protagonist is not films, the protagonist is history in your book. You're interested in history and the creation of history through cinema. So in your respective writings, what is it that you are drawn towards immediately, initially? Is it the artist figure or is it just their art or is it the broader structures at play? Me? <laughs> okay. Um, no, I, I, I think that there is a very specific modernist tradition of critical writing in which the art is supposed to take you into the consciousness of the artist. Right. You know, the purpose of all this is to understand who is Picasso or who is some great auteur, if you like. This becomes a problem, uh, it's a very famous problem in cinema when you go to, uh, Muni mentioned Manmohan Desai, uh, when you go to a filmmaker who works with the genre, the, the generic kind of structure. I mean, uh, is, the, is, is writing about Amar Akbar Anthony going to better understand Manmohan Desai? Is that the point of this? Or is Amar Akbar Anthony to be viewed as a separate work from the inner sort of consciousness of the filmmaker? Uh, so I think it depends on what you are writing about, you know, I mean the first book that I ever wrote was in fact on Ritwik Ghatak. Now there the persona, I mean it's a lot like Guru Dutt in that sense, right? I mean there the persona is a very huge overdetermined kind of figure of, of history. And there is, there has to be then a sense of recognizing that all of these films, and there weren't so many, uh, actually take you inexorably to their maker. And you have to try and understand who he was to be able to understand who the films were. This applies for Guru Dutt. This applies for a certain kind of filmmaking that, that, that does that. But for a lot of other films, when you're looking at, um, particularly I think genre films or mainstream commercial films, for example, you have to have a quite different frame to understand those mm -hmm. rather than trying to understand who they, who they were made by. Uh, this is contentious, I mean, and, and different people can have different views on it. So, for example, you know, it has been said in Hollywood, you know, that, um, I don't know, a friend, uh, John Ford or somebody like that actually does have a certain auteurist sort of consistency even over films that are of a very, very different kind. And you may in India want to make the same claim for uh, Prakash Mehra or... Uh, uh, Sanjay Leela Bhansali uh, or somebody of that sort but somebody else may actually say well I think I'd, I would like to see this film much more in some other frame it depends on what your approach is I guess but what is your approach because one of the comments actually about your book the Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema was that uh, there's a post-structuralist ideology uh, which by, by, by that they mean that it's ultimately rejection of autism and even arguably the pleasures of Indian cinema. That was one of the it's comments. It's a rejection of autism. Yeah, do you, that, that's a, that, that was a comment that was made about the encyclopedia. Do you agree with that? No, I, I, I'd be interested to know who said that. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just want to proceed this by saying that, you know, Muni wanted to establish earlier a sort of a fault line of maybe uh, even a difference of opinion. I don't think there is one. Okay. Uh, Muni is indeed uh, been much more associated, more famously associated with Gurudath and so on. She has done more than anybody else in making independent avant-garde cinema available to audiences, especially in the UK. I, on the other hand, uh, in the Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema, have made every effort to include you know, the mainstream commercial cinema. So there isn't that much of a, right. a difference there. Um, I, I did not quite understand what, what, what a post-structuralist rejection of authorship. I mean, I, people have their views. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it is the Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema does try to bring a new frame to understanding Indian cinema's history for two reasons. You know, the one thing is that, you know, what happened was that they'll say, why is so-and-so not there? Why is there no entry on Sanjay Dutt? Why is there no entry on Helen? 
the point is that we were trying to really, really, really cover a cinema that nobody had heard of. So, yeah. roughly speaking, what happened was that we were trying to have an entry on one film out of every 20 that were made in India, mm. right? Which meant that if there were, uh, let's say, uh, 200 films in Manipur, Manipuri made, then we would try and carry at least 10, you know, in there. Mm. Now, you'd never heard of those Manipuri films, you'd never heard of films made in Dogri, you'd never heard of films made in Maithili. So, there was a real effort to kind of have that pan-Indian sort of scale. In fact, a big argument that I'd had with Paul Williman, with whom I did the encyclopedia, was whether Indian filmmakers working in the UK should be considered Indian filmmakers or not. I thought they should be. Uh, the British Film Institute didn't agree, and so we did not carry, say, Merchant Ivory, ah. or, or some, you know, Ismail yeah. Merchant, or, or uh, the fact that uh, Indian cinema existed for something like 40 years before the partition mm. meant that you included filmmakers who were subsequently Pakistani before yeah. 47. But what about post 47? Mm. You know, why not include filmmakers? Why not actually have a South Asian perspective? What happens when an Indian filmmaker like Ritwik Ghatak makes a film which is a Bangladeshi film? You know, Tita Shikti Nodir Nam. Those were questions that actually became really quite, quite uh, interesting and significant for me, rather than this kind of, I mean, shall I say post-structuralist rejection or whatever it was. I mean, I, I, I don't quite get that. I mean, people are entitled to their views, as I say. Nasreen? Well, uh, to go back to one point about whether writing on cinema, you know, is, is a, it's a poor man's form. I think actually writing on cinema legitimizes cinema. So if you look at Hollywood in the 30s when the French critics started, like Bazin and various, uh, started writing about Hollywood, then Hollywood itself more seriously. So in a way, the writing on cinema, on Indian cinema, has a similar kind of effect, I think. Now, talking about Aishish's uh, comment, I must say one thing. We also, in the same logic and the same argument, we should say the choice of subjects in terms of the writing on films or the books on films tell a lot to you and all of us about the writers themselves. Manmohan Desai's films may not tell us much about the kind of character he was, but it tells us somewhat, Amar Akbar Anthony in particular, his, his idea of national integration, his ideas about the fact that Amar Akbar Anthony are all le legitimate children of India. And that is where you look for Desai's thinking. You say that in Kool Kapool, Dharam Patra, and today you see that in the popular films. You know the titles. They tell you something about the filmmaker and where he stands. So therefore, you may not tell the personality. That distinction, I'd say the political views you can tell in terms of the popular cinema, but the actual uh, personal angst you can tell in author's films, or not angst only, but preoccupations. So you see it in Bresson, you see it in, uh, in Gurudat. But those are kind of different ways of looking at what information you're getting about that filmmaker through his work. Now, coming back to the writing on cinema, the encyclopedia that Ashish and Paul did, Willeman did, were exceedingly important because you are talking about a time before Google and Internet. Where did you find this information? You had to go to that encyclopedia. Whether it was in completely, I mean, in totality, everything was there or not, that was the only main source that had any kind of research behind it. He had a team of many researchers, and also Mr. Nair was involved, mm -hmm. and they were very thorough, very thorough, as much as humanly possible. This was the time before the internet. People forget how difficult it was to see anything. Today, if you want to see a film clip, you just click onto YouTube and you can watch Edil uh, Rubah, uh, the song by Janis Arakhtar. In those days, up to the 90s, you had to go to the Pune Film Archives to see it. So access was a big problem. And so therefore, the writing on cinema, coming back to the main point, tells you a lot about the writer. And I tell, when I see Ashi's work, I see that he, he searches for a, a kind of... Um, analysis that is extremely uh, important and relevant in terms of the context in which films are made 
and he tells you a lot about that era, and that's very important. Rashmi's work is has a, an amazing uh, uh, contribution towards Asian cinema that has been really very, very solid. And the only thing you can look for in my work is the horse's mouth. You're selling yourself short. That's not true, Rashmi. Yeah. Uh, well, this whole uh, debate, as Ashi said, about the art and the artist, and that the artist being the f kind of uh, found of the artwork, and uh, that, that there's a long uh, tradition of uh, thinking on that. Uh, the classical thinking is that the artist uh, is the originator of, of a work, and uh, the work and the artist are kind of synergetically connected with each other. But the post-structuralists that you mentioned uh, have a very different, uh, uh, you know, the critical theorists have a different viewpoint on that. And I can just uh, uh, refer to Foucault, what is an author, or Barth and death of an author, where they're actually looking at the work as a system of codes. As um, and the structuralist, structuralist looked for the deeper structures, the deeper structures that created that work of art, uh, rather than a persona, the persona of the artist. And the post structuralists are looking at the surface, the pleasures that the surface affords, the modes of address that that text with all its codes uh, conveys, and so on. So um, I think that this is a long debate. Probably this is not uh, the place for it. But to come back to Gurudat, uh, there is this uh, wonderful scene in Piazza where um, he, you know, there's that beggar in the station, and uh, the coats are exchanged, and in a sense, the identities get exchanged with the external coat which is not the body, but it's, it's just something you put on. But it's, it, there's this whole very complex uh, kind of um, uh, meanings, all kinds of meanings that are set up with that entire sequence. So um, this is, in fact, uh, one of the critical theory, uh, theory I mean, one of the critical theory uh, postulations that there is no author it's the specific set of texts which create the author. That is, you know, the, it, it's the, it's the um, inverse way of looking at it from the classical point of view, which said the author is the originator and the, uh, of the text. And this says, well, there is a set of texts and we can kind of deduce the author or reduce the author from the set of uh, texts. So uh, this is a lot of you know, what happens, uh, at Guru Dutt, for instance, um, you know, the whole discussion about Sahib Bibi um, or Ghulam, the, uh, who exactly is the author of, uh, author rather, of uh, that film. And I think, uh, you know, there's this uh, um, very famous uh, Soviet culturologist called Mikhail Bakhtin, and he in the 20s had a group of uh, colleagues. Uh, Valentin Valashinov and Pavel Medvedev, all three of them used to discuss and write. And after uh, several decades uh, and many tragedies, um, the question of who exactly is the author of all these books that had carried their names came about. So in the end, uh, it was a kind of general consensus, not by those authors themselves, because two of them were already dead and gone uh, tragically by then. But uh, by the people looking at their works that you just use obliques, you know, so you say Bakhtin, oblique, Valashinov, oblique, Medvedev. And it's the same with Gurudat and um, uh, Abraham and so, so on. So I think that uh, the question of authorship is, is far more complex than just uh, as someone giving birth to a particular work. Um, but I also think that uh, the kind of writings that have uh, come up in the 21st century within India in terms of a whole lot of biographies uh, as a genre are 
very valuable in their own ways. And uh, they actually can provide, you know, they are a kind of archive and the title of this session is chronically. So they're chronicles, which is a temporal thing and archiving, which is spatial, virtual or physical, whatever, uh, to uh, do greater research. I mean, to do more research, further research. Right. There's also like a spurt of biographies and autobiographies in the past few years um, across publications. I want to ask all three of you about grand narratives. So you wrote this encyclopedia of Indian cinema, and then for the people who can't read that, you wrote also a very short history of Indian cinema. Uh, Nasreen, you, for film comment, you wrote this gorgeous piece, A Brief History of Bollywood Film Songs. Rashmi, you had written about Hindi commercial cinema changing narrative strategies. You all, all were, at some point in your writing career, looking at broad trends that were happening within Hindi cinema, within Indian cinema sometimes. Is there a threat or a worry of over-determining the present or overstating the past? I'll give an example. For example, when we think about Bachchan today, uh, Bachchan in the 70s, we talk about the angry young man coming out of the disillusionment of the 70s, the emergency. But when Javed Saab was asked about it, he said, we just wrote it. We didn't think about these. These, these were not things that we considered while concocting the angry young man. So these are things that we have read into the films, we have read into the past. Is there a worry of overreading the past and overstating the present? Uh, uh, no, um, see here's the thing, basically I think what happens is that you keep reading the past at different moments in the present differently. Let me give you an explicit example, the emergency, okay? Now the emergency has been known to have had a huge impact on cinema. Um, it is very well known that the emergency is something that frames the Bachchan figure, for instance, you know, that the particular idea of the angry young man relates to a particular sort of radical uh, disaffection with the state that started from se early, the early 70s and went on to the mid 70s and frames a certain kind of context that that, that define the emergency. There is also a post-emergency situation that, that, that you have in this context. Now, the emergency has uh, been dealt with at different times. I think Javed Akhtar himself has something to say about that particular history, in fact, in conversation with, with Muni. Uh, and it's a very important way, way he frames it. Today, uh, you know, when I did John Ghatak Tarkovsky, um, and I'm looking at this particular political movement that you see in 2015, the emergency looks very different. You know, I am no longer interested anymore as I think about the political situation we're in now, you know, with the totalitarian structures that we are currently encountering. And I, when I say currently, I don't even mean like 2023. I mean as recently as between 2014 and 2019, you know. Uh, when you actually saw those protest movements take place, the emergency looks quite different from this framework than it did even, even at that time. And I think this happens, you know, I think from time to time, history can get rewritten and, you know, sort of a historical revision, revisionism takes place. And along with it, a retrospective uh, rethinking of the importance of, take Divar. Uh, you know, a film about which so much has been written. I think Diwar has undergone fundamental transformations in how that film is seen. Was seen at the time, was seen a decade later, and is seen now. You know, its, its significance today is quite different from what it may have been as recently as in the, in the 90s. And I think that's an interesting sort of development that does take place. Rashmi, Nasreen. Um, I think, uh, actually, she's absolutely right. I think uh, his... Films should be seen at different decades because people's understanding, not only of cinema, but of their cultural context. And the cultural context doesn't always, isn't always apparent instantly. It cannot be. Uh, however, there's also the subjective view. But I think it is hugely important that we should recognize the fact that cinema has now become, uh, when you were talking about the many biographies, Sometimes they have a lot of information, but to me, the level of information is Wikipedia. It is not insightful, and it isn't often very, uh, very interesting. It's often I listings, agree. endless, endless listings. 
some composer and he's written this song and then this song and then this song and then this song. And you think to yourself, well, why don't we just go to Spotify and drop this book? So, I mean, there's a, there's a question of how seriously you take your subject. Frankly, I think the choice of your subject has to come from a passion for the subject. And there has to be a good reason for choosing that subject. It has to have some layers to it. it that's why Guru Dev has been written about by many people, because he has many layers. It is absolutely true of Mehboob Khan, but many people have not written about him. But there's many layers to his work, or Bimal Roy, and so on. I mean, the person must present with many layers, like uh, Rashi's work on Ghatak. Ghatak has a, you know, there's a French uh, tapestry called Milfei, which has a thousand <laughs> layers. That's why it's called thousand layer patristry and uh, these people give you a lot more and as she says you look at Katak film or you look at uh, Mehboob Khan's Andaz every 10 years and you're going to see something different and that to me is really the secret of not only a classic but a great work it doesn't reveal itself in one reading it doesn't and uh, that is a very important thing. So the question really is, is how do you choose your subject of writing? I mean, I don't know who is in the audience, but there may be people who want to write about cinema. But you have to be very passionate about that idea. Rashmi? Yeah, I think uh, there is a, a particular trend that questions uh, grand narr narratives of all sorts. But I, for one, uh, do believe in grand narratives. Uh, I think the people who question grand narratives are those who want to emphasize the fragments, which is fine, but uh, grand narratives are still important because they're the ones that are going to give you the micro view on history. Uh, and these uh, views may be revised, as Ashish and Nasreen have pointed out, that these views are open to, if they are not uh, authoritarian views, they should be open to uh, being debated, discussed, and even revised. So if we look at the history of cinema and writings on cinema, which is what this panel is about, um, we find so many debates, for instance, about the rise of Nazism between the two world wars and the two kind of cinemas that it uh, engendered, right? One was the uh, cinema that uh, uh, praised uh, Nazism, I mean, Leni Riefenstahl and so on, and the other, was the one that expressed the anxiety of the times that was through the movement of expressionism. And th there's no time to go into details, but uh, this, the writing and the debates on it within the Frankfurt School is, is so important. And, and these are large narratives. These are grand narratives about how art can actually express uh, the socio-historical context, the economic context of the times. If you look at Latin America, there are all these fantastic manifestos, and those are writings too, and they are grand narratives too, because Latin American filmmakers, whether from Cuba, you have Espinosa's Imperfect uh, Cinema, you have um, Solanus Getino's uh, Third Cinema, all these are now pretty old. Uh, probably the audience is very young. Uh, but these were absolute signposts in the history of cinema. These are uh, insisting on grand narratives, the uh, Latin Americans against neocolonialism, against imperialism, and the creation of a cinema. In fact, they even criticized uh, the socialist systems and their cinemas because they said, you are not breaking entirely with the kind of infrastructural frameworks that that a radical cinema really was. So there were those grand debates out there. And uh, of course, within India, I mean, um, it's not just uh, Divar. I mean, Divar, yes. Uh, and as Nasreen and Ashish have pointed out, you, you can go back to that text ever so many times and read it again. Uh, but look at the new, uh, what interests me as a writer is what are the new narratives what are the new characters who are coming forth uh, to who represent the contradictions of the present times? Um, one of, uh, I mean, a very interesting character for me, for instance, was uh, Hazaro Kwaishe's I 
SC, uh, uh, you know, there's that fixer character in that. And uh, that was very interesting. But you look at the kind of spy films we are having now, you know, where, where, the, uh, where, the, where the main lead is an intelligence officer and so on and so forth. I think there's a lot to be analyzed and understood from uh, where these new kind of characters who have, uh, you know, who are very important because the narrative centers around them, what, what, uh, uh, what they represent for the current times. And I think there's a, a great deal of very interesting cinema. And it's not just in, um, in the North, in, in Bombay, but there are very vibrant cinemas in Kerala, and elsewhere in the south, in Punjab, which which are taking up uh, issues in a very very uh, of con of contemporary relevance uh, in very very pointed ways. Thanks, Rashmi. Rashmi, I want to ask you more about uh, cinema, which you, Latika, uh, Aruna came up with. Ar Arun Kopkar called you all the Teen Devia, uh, and. It's I mean, just look at the range of, of countries they spoke about. There's Mongolia, Syria, Palestine, Vietnam, Singapore, Myanmar, of course, along with Japan, China, India, Iran, Philippines. Uh, one of your issues on censorship was actually funded by the Ministry of Culture, which I find uh, very moving in, in today's context, at least. Uh, why I'm bringing that up is because MAMI this year has a new expanded vision, right? It's not just India. We're looking at South Asian cinema. Uh, the competition section has been enlarged to include South Asian cinema, c more countries. Um, what is it that you have gained over the years editing that, that journal, the quarterly? Um, how has watching or reading about uh, cinema from these various countries helped enrich your understanding of Indian cinema? Um, thank you for this question. Actually, um, I, I think it's very... Um, uh, I don't know if I should use the word unfortunate, but it 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 is a puzzle as to why uh, we have our local identities, uh, but we can never talk of a regional identity, our South Asian identity, um, and our Asian identity, which which is also so very uh, important. Uh, if we look at uh, South Asia and uh, the tremendous kind of cultural productions that are coming out of this entire region, not just India with its diverse and uh, many film industries, but uh, very uh, interesting films from Bangladesh, from Nepal, documentaries from, uh, they have the wonderful South Asian cinema festival there, the Himal festival and uh, Pakistan which has its own uh, industry as well as a very thriving um, serials you know they're very good at those serials which are watched uh, throughout the subcontinent and so on so um, it, it opened my eyes the editing that uh, quarterly really opened my eyes to other identities that we can have. And I think that we can really learn from East Asia, the kind of transnationalisms that exist there, despite all political uh, problems. Uh, in terms of culture, there is so much give and take between Japan, South Korea, China, uh, Thailand, Philippines, Southeast Asia, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the kind of remakes, the kind of markets they provide each other, the kind of um, audiences. Um, there is, it, it is very, very vibrant. The, the question of transnationalism is, is also very interesting because we really, ha though we have a cinema which is uh, producing the industries, which are producing the largest number of films, which is seen by audiences all over the world, we are not really able to cross over. Apart from the diasporic filmmakers, the Asian American or the uh, filmmakers of Indian origin in uh, England and so on, I'm not talking about them, but our own cinema, which is made here, this is, you see, even a small, uh, as they call it, a city-state, uh, Hong Kong, um, is able to have 
crossover cinemas, you know, Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, John Ho. I mean, and it's not just one, it, but it's a whole line of fight choreographers, not just directors, but actors, fight choreographers, so many people who are able to create a global platform them for themselves. And by global, I don't mean just the West or making it in America or anything like that, but to move out into the larger neighborhood of even Asia, it is so important. And I'll just finish with, um, you see, these are still rooted transnationalisms. I would also like to point to something that I call the unrooted transnationalism, not rootless, but unrooted. There is this Thai filmmaker, Avangad, Veera Sethukul. Uh, his name is uh, Apit Thakpong. Yeah, uh, yeah, he is. Uh, he has made a film called Memoria, which has got funds from all over the world, even from Qatar and various places, various countries. And he has set. He's got actors from uh, England and from elsewhere, and the whole narrative is set in Colombia. So this is a certain kind of cosmopolitanism or transnationalism, which is deliberately unrooted. It's not like, say, Song of the Scorpions, uh, which is a very interesting film by uh, Anup Singh, which has funding from Sweden, France, Singapore. It has an Iranian actress playing the role of an Indian protagonist in the story, but the story is still set in India. So there is a certain rootedness, though the money and other things may have come from elsewhere. So this question of the transnational is very interesting. And I do think that we need to think of the transnational in terms of South Asia as well as Asia and Eurasia. Thank you. Lovely. So then we'll just go with one round of a final question, which is recommend one book about cinema that you've read in the past month or year um, that's moved you, that you consider a bit of a Bible? Is that be silence because there are too many books or too little books? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, Actually, I've been reading a lot of books, but not about cinema because I, I mean, uh, cinema is a com is a is a is a large term, but uh, you know, one of the arguments that I've actually been making is film. That you know, we can't really keep talking about film because there isn't any such thing as film anymore. You know, uh, there is data, essentially, um, and the manner in which everything is now becoming data. Is, is central to all that I'm thinking right now. So I can actually recommend some pretty interesting books on moving image data, which aren't really about film. Sure. So Wendy Chun, um, she's got this remarkable book called Updating to Remain the Same, uh, where she says, uh, habit plus crisis equals update. So <laughs> this thing about this constant need to create updates, you know, for your software, you know, to actually sort of, you know, just stay where you are, you know, so you will create newer and newer iterations, you will create newer and newer versions. So they were in 2023, when you say, as I think you were saying earlier, that you, oh my God, look at Guide, you know, today. So this is Guide 2023. Uh, this is not even guide that we had two years ago. I think that this is this is a strange new situation that we are in, where you're literally updating to remain the same, updating to keep guide where it is, because guide next year will be another guide. Then you'll get a guide in 4K. Then you'll get a guide in something else. You know, that kind of situation, I think, is really fascinating for me. It's a book about cinema, but it doesn't really up, doesn't talk about cinema. So Wendy Chun, it's a trilogy of books that she writes, and I think that's a remarkable Remarkable text. Thank you, Ashish. Nasreen, Rashmi. Hey, I think uh, what Ashish says is very interesting, this updating. It's absolutely true. It's like there are now people who will see Devanand's films or Vijayanand's films or whoever will actually think they're seeing something that they have discovered something extraordinary when it was extraordinary in his time. So people are not always looking at cinema of its time, in its time. They're always talking about adding the experience today, what they know of it today. All kinds of things get added. Now, I wouldn't say I, I've been doing 
actually not a subtitle in recent including Jawan. So I will not be able to tell you how much I've read. So, but I must say, my favorite books on cinema have to be conversations. And one is The Hitchcock and Truffaut. Again, unbelievable clarity of Truffauts an unbelievable openness of Hitchcock. And I thought Cameron Crowe and Billy Wilder was an extraordinary conversation because here you have a man, Billy Wilder, who is a man of words, even though when you see his filmed interviews, you, he had a very, very thick Austrian accent. And yet he was so American in his, in his uh, screenplays that he wrote with Diamond. And I think the book of uh, Conversation tells you so much about these people both of uh, Truffaut and Hitchcock and uh, Billy Wilder. So those are really uh, very important. One other thing I would like to add to what Ashish just said about this updating. What I think seems to be happening, I may be totally generalizing, but what seems to be happening in Indian cinema right now is there are films being produced and there are big events. Now, cinema has become an event like a football match or a cricket match. So you have Barbie or Oppenheimer, then you have Jawan or Pathan. So you have to have an event around it. And it doesn't matter anymore what the film is. And I think that is really what is taking over big screen cinema. They say, oh, it's great to see films on the big screen. There are lots of films on the big screen. The question is, can you create an event around it? Then you get the audience. And I think this is a slightly sad story happening because it's not a football match. Rashmi? Okay, so I'll quickly just go through some names from the printed era uh, that I have loved uh, reading again and again. Eisenstein on Indifferent Nature, Dillers and uh, Donald Ritchie on Ozu, uh, Stephen Teo on Hong Kong Cinema, and uh, within India, Cinema and I, Ghatak, and uh, Money Calls writings, which are extremely uh, stimulating. But I, I just want to add a little of what I've been reading uh, uh, recently, and Ashish is perfectly right that uh, things have changed so drastically with the digital turn and so on. So I've been looking at a whole range of writings on um, images that, um, you know, it's they're called, there's this uh, uh, thinker called Stephen uh, Vial who talks of ontophony, that the uh, instrument actually creates the image. And so the microscope is what will show you the virus and bacteria, bacteria which you won't see otherwise, right? You have to see the so the, there it's the image. It's the images being created by the instrument. And it's true of, say, the Hubble or all these images from space that are coming to us, which are being brought to us by non-organically driven cameras, in a sense. And uh, so th the whole range of uh, such writings, Lev Manovich, uh, Poster, Mark Poster, and uh, Hugh Machines, and so on, AI, I think we, uh, my generation is probably trying to figure out all that. <laughs> because, well, there's a time lag for us. <laughs> Rashmi, Nasreen, Ashish, for your time, for your insight, for your kindness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.